Hi everybody, welcome to my channel. In this video, we're going to take a look into the case of Susan Wright. She made headlines in 2003 when she stabbed her husband 193 times. Then she buried him in their backyard. I remember this case in a TV show called 48 Hour Mystery with Kelly Siegler, the prosecutor. And I remember the circus, you know, the bed in the courtroom and Kelly Siegler on top of her colleague imitating how the crime might have happened. I remember I was convinced. But let's take a look. Let's ask some questions. What led Susan to do this? What was her motive? Was it self-defense? Or was it for insurance money? But first, let's start from the beginning. Susan Wright was born Susan Lucille Reich on April 24, 1976 in Houston, Texas. Susan, Cindy and their brother Jim were raised in an upper middle class home in the Champions area of Northwest Harris County. Their mom was a stay-at-home mom, their father was a mechanical engineer and according to Susan and Cindy, their father had a temper who usually attacked their mother and beat them too. And this is something that both parents would deny. Susan was described as shy and as someone who had trouble to stand up for herself. Susan was an average student in high school. She had a few boyfriends and she did everything she could to please them. After Susan turned 18 in her senior year and encouraged by her then boyfriend, she went to work as a dancer at a topless bar called The Gold Cup in far north Houston. She quit dancing after two months because she didn't feel comfortable and the money wasn't worth it. But she kept working there as a waitress. After she graduated from high school, she took some junior college classes and she worked at a hair salon. In 1998, she worked at an orthodontist office. While the information about how Susan met Jeffrey isn't consistent, but they met in April 1997, and there are several versions. The first one is, they met while she was working as a restaurant waitress. Then the second version, she met him on a trip to Gavison with a friend. And the third version, they met on a double date. She was 20 years old at the time, and he was 29. And while they were dating, Susan described him as very sweet, very handsome, and with beautiful brown eyes. He bought her flowers, took her to nice restaurants and nightclubs. And then, in February 1998, Susan became pregnant. Susan and Jeffrey got married in October 1998 in a pre-church ceremony while she was eight and a half months pregnant with her first son, Bradley. Jeffrey was characterized as charming. He had no trouble meeting women. He was someone who liked to have fun. He indulged in drugs and he also liked topless clubs. Jeffrey's friends said that Jeffrey appeared to be a proud father and he enjoyed the stability of a family life. Jeffrey worked as a sales representative for a carpet and tiles company. After the birth of their first son, Susan was a stay-at-home mom and even though for some, they were a picture-perfect family, as we learn later on, the marriage between the two of them was anything but perfect. Here's the thing. Never believe in picture-perfect relationships. Never. When people advertise too much their relationship and how wonderful it is, chances are it's the opposite. Susan and Jeffrey had two children. Bradley was born in 1998 and Kaylee was born in 2002. On January 13, 2003, at the Wright family home, Susan allegedly tied her husband to their bed and stabbed him 193 times with two different knives. And then she buried him in their backyard in a shallow hole. 
After the stabbing and Jeffrey was dead, she buried the body in their backyard and from time to time she would go there and add more soil to weigh him down. She went to the police station the next day to report a domestic abuse incident and got a restraining order against Jeffrey to explain his disappearance. She then cut the bloody carpet in her bedroom and she tried to paint the bedroom walls. And then she dragged the blood-soaked mattress to the backyard and she left it there. She wasn't very good at hiding, was she? Five days after the murder, Susan told her mother what happened. Then the family contacted a prestigious Houston law firm. Susan's lawyer went to her home. This is where she admitted killing and burying her husband. And then Susan was admitted to a mental health facility. In the same day, Susan the lawyer went to the district's attorney office and reported a dead body, gave them the address, but he didn't reveal who his client was and if the client knew about the dead body in the backyard. Well, on January 24th, Susan Wright turned herself in at the Harris County Courthouse. When the authorities arrived at Susan's house, they discovered Jeffrey's partially buried body in a shallow hole. They also found a blood-soaked matrix box springs comforter and a headboard in the backyard. Inside the home, they found the following. One wall of the master bedroom had been painted. A piece of the carpet had been cut out. There were painting supplies, a box cutter, and also scissors. They also found blood spatters on the curtains and other items in the bedroom. They found a receipt for two gallons of bleach and they also found a bleach stained size 6 jeans and also a towel. Jeffrey's body was found nude. He had ligatures on his arms and one leg and this was from a necktie on each wrist and a bathrobe sash on one ankle. They also found candle wax on Jeffrey's tie and scrotum. The medical examiner determined Jeffrey died of multiple force injuries. He had been stabbed at least 193 times. There were 41 stab wounds to his face, 23 to his neck, 46 to his chest, 22 to the abdomen, 7 to the pubic region, 19 to his legs, 23 to his arms and hand, 1 to his back, and the tip of a knife was broken off in the top of Jeffrey's skull. Susan was charged with murder and she pleaded not guilty by reason of self-defense. The trial started on February 24, 2004. The prosecution and defense had different versions of what, why, and how it happened. Of course, they're on different sides. Susan herself testified during trial, and according to the prosecution, the motive for the crime would have been the $200,000 life insurance policy. Show me the money. Jeffrey's co-worker testified that he overheard Susan on the phone berating Jeff for not filling out the life insurance paperwork correctly. The prosecutor stated that Susan had a plan on the night she killed Jeffrey. She seduced him, tied him to their bed, then she stabbed him over and over and over again. Then she buried her husband's body, tried to cover up the crime, and she began telling lies to his family and friends. She said that Jeffrey hit Bradley, he abused her, and then he left. She then reported to her doctor some physical abuse and filed a criminal charge against Jeffrey, which resulted on a warrant for his arrest. The plan didn't succeed because the family's dog dug up the body. While the prosecutor actually acknowledged that the relationship wasn't healthy and it would end badly. However, Kelly Siegler, the prosecutor, said Susan was lying about the abuse she suffered because there was no physical evidence. She was never treated for injuries and no one had ever seen that type of behavior. By the contrary, witnesses described Jeffrey 
has kind and a gentle husband, and that the two were very loving towards each other. Kelly stated that Susan's story about Jeffrey being cocaine fueled and coming to her with a knife was ridiculous. Ridiculous. Also, Kelly claimed it would be impossible for Susan to overtake Jeffrey after the beating and assault her because of her size. She also described Susan as calculating and deliberate. She claimed because Susan removed Jeffrey's name off the outgoing message on their answering machine and cleaned out their joint checking account, the defense's theory that Susan was in a fog after the murder was to cover up the crime. The prosecutor stated that the day after the stabbing, Susan went to the police to press charges and she used the injuries from the night before as evidence against her husband and proved the alleged abuse she suffered. And to prove how calculating Susan was, the prosecutor used the example of Susan telling Jeffrey's mother that he stormed off after a violent tantrum, he had started abusing cocaine, he was behind on their bills, he wasn't showing up to work very often, and he tried to borrow money to pay for his drug habit. The prosecutor also stated that Susan was a good actress and manipulated everyone around her. And to actually prove her point and make a mark with the jury, Kelly Siegler actually brought the bed, the actual bed, with the blood-stained mattress into the courtroom. Kelly played Susan and her colleague played Jeffrey. They tied him up to the bed with neckties and a bathroom sash. Then Kelly climbed onto the bed and see she straddled her colleague and with a knife she demonstrated how Jeffrey was likely killed. And this was a way to convince the jury what Susan had done. Well, when I watched the 48 hour mystery, when she did that, I was convinced. Well, during closing arguments, Kelly Siegler brought up the fact that Susan had been a topless dancer when she was 18. And this is slut shaming. And this tactic is quite common. And I find it unnecessary and despicable. Because Kelly Siegler is a woman. And here we had a woman saying that another woman could kill her husband because she had also been a topless dancer. This is slut shaming, nothing more. Being a topless dancer for two months doesn't add anything to what happened that night. Susan was a teenager, Susan and Jeffrey hadn't even met yet, and I'm sure there were other ways to attack Susan's character, for sure. Shame on you, Kelly Siegel, shame on you. Now let's go to the other side, the defense team. The defense claimed that Susan and her husband had a master-slave relationship. Susan was fearful of her husband about everything, about the children acting up, late dinners, which would cause a violent reaction from Jeffrey. Witnesses for the defense team testified that Jeffrey abused his dog quite often. I'm pissed about this one. It was also mentioned that Jeffrey was convicted of assaulting a stripper he was having a love affair with. One of Jeffrey's party friends testified that Jeffrey often lost control, he flew into violent rages, and many of these were drug-fueled. Susan's sister testified of being aware of Jeff's abuse towards Susan, and also a neighbor testified that Susan was afraid of Jeffrey. Susan's addresser claimed that she noticed bruises on Susan, which led her to believe it was from domestic abuse. The defense team also stated that Jeffrey was someone who valued appearances, and he was very careful where he abused Susan, so people wouldn't notice the injuries. Oh my goodness, the defense team had some criticism and pointed out some of the police work on processing the crime scene. They mentioned that the police ignored evidence in the home, like the holes in the wall, 
which were made when Jeffrey tried to punch Susan, but he missed. And then he tried to patch those holes. Then they also mention a shattered bathroom door frame when Jeffrey smashed the door against Susan's arm repeatedly. The bed frame was never checked for fibers from neckties and sashes. And the fingernail clippings from Jeffrey's hands, which would have showed that he scratched Susan, were improperly preserved and became moldy in an evidence room. The defense claimed that the constant abuse Susan suffered affected her mental health and her emotional state, and on the night that she killed Jeffrey, she was pushed over the edge and broke with reality. And they also pointed out the following reasons to explain what happened the week after the killings on which Susan experienced the fog. Well, she did a poor job cleaning the crime scene. Instead of showing a ruthless calculating murder, it showed someone completely detached from reality. The defense claimed that the motive presented by the prosecutor, the life insurance policy, Susan didn't know about this, but she did know that Jeffrey wanted to take one on her. The defense team also stated that Susan, at least, should get probation if found guilty. So, maybe the 193 stab wounds were a whoopsie daisies moment, he now did. Susan testified that she had endured horrific abuse during her five-year marriage. She testified that Jeffrey was sadistic, a drug-abusing brute. He belittled her. He controlled her. He assaulted her whenever he felt like it. Susan also described how the murder went. She said that Jeffrey had returned home from a boxing session. He was high on cocaine. He tried to get Bradley to box with him. He popped Bradley with his fist. He later attacked Susan. She told him he needed to go to get help, he ordered her to get into the bed, and then he assaulted her. Susan testified that Jeffrey left for a few moments, and when he returned, he was holding a butcher knife. He waved it over her head, and then he shouted, Die, B! Susan threw her hands up, and she grabbed the knife and started to kick him with her right knee. Jeffrey loosened the grip of the knife and she took the knife from him. Then she stabbed him in the neck. And she kept on stabbing him because she thought that he would kill her if she stopped. Bradley knocked on the bedroom door. She tied Jeff's right arm to the bed with a necktie because she thought that he would get up and attack her. She hid the knife and she walked Bradley back to his room. She then got another knife from the kitchen because she thought that Jeffrey might have found the first one. She stabbed his legs for all the times that he had kicked her. She stabbed his penis for all the times that he assaulted her. She cut the tie that was securing his hands to the bed. She pulled him off the bed. Jeffrey's shoulder hit the nightstand, which caused the red candle wax to spill. She brought a dolly. She put him on it. She used a necktie to fasten his left hand to the dolly. She used a bathrobe sash to secure his feet. She then put Jeffrey's body into a hole and covered him with dirt. After all of this, Susan believed that Jeffrey was still alive. So, she sat on the couch for the rest of the night and with a knife in her hand. She testified that she had a mental breakdown that night and that she didn't tell anyone for days because she thought that he was going to get up and come after her. Susan also said that when she got pregnant with Bradley, Jeffrey said that he was okay with her having an abortion. A few months later, Bradley was born and Jeffrey changed. He started calling her fat ass. He got angry when she was diagnosed with postpartum depression. Jeffrey wouldn't allow her to take antidepressants. And Jeffrey wanted Susan to be a stay-at-home mom too. Susan was only allowed to be gone for one hour and a half for groceries and visit her mother. She asked him if she could take some courses on 
on a junior college and he said no. When she visited the campus one night to try to enroll in an internet course, he called her a nasty whore. She didn't know he had pleaded guilty in 1996 to a felony drug possession charge and was placed on probation. He smoked marijuana almost every afternoon after work and she told the jury the abuse escalated after they moved into their patio home in April 1999. Susan testified that Jeffrey hit her and kicked her repeatedly in the chest, in the stomach and in the back and legs. In one attempt for Susan to move out, she called her sister Cindy and Cindy picked her up. However, Jeffrey called the next morning and he threatened to kill her or Bradley if she didn't come back. In December 2000, she got pregnant again. Jeffrey kicked her in the stomach and she had a miscarriage. After the birth of Kaylee, Jeffrey started to date other women through an internet dating service and he gave Susan herpes. By the fall of 2002, Jeffrey changed jobs and his behavior became more erratic. Also during this trial, Bradley testified by video saying that he never saw his father hit his mother, but he had seen bruises on Susan's leg. He was four years old at the time. Susan's mother also testified and she denied the claims that she had suffered abuse from Susan's father like Susan and Cindy had claimed. Well, the prosecution and the defense rested. And on March 2nd, 2004, after five hours of deliberations, Susan was found guilty of murder and she was sentenced to 25 years in prison. In 2005, Susan Wright's conviction was upheld. But in 2008, there was a new reappeal which stated Susan had ineffective assistance during the punishment phase of the trial in 2004. The new defense team claimed Susan's defense attorneys neglected to call witnesses to the stand to verify Susan's claims of the abuse. The defense also neglected to call domestic violence experts to explain what Susan had gone through. And this would fall into the category of battered women syndrome which affect women who have been victims of long-term abuse and believe their only way out is to kill their abusers. The new defense also claimed that they never called the psychologist who evaluated Susan after the crime and found her in a near psychotic state. There was also a witness who would account her experience of violence and abuse she suffered during her relationship with Jeffrey. And this witness was Jeffrey's ex-fiance and she was the wife of former NFL Super Bowl champion Steve Michael. Her name was Misty Michael and Misty had a similar story to Susan. She worked as a stripper at the Colorado Bar and Grill and that's where she met Jeffrey. So, according to Misty, they began dating and got engaged shortly after. Misty moved to Austin with Jeffrey. Initially, he was charming and then he became abused. He first verbally abused her, then he started the physical abuse. In a violent episode, Misty filed a police report. Jeffrey was arrested for assault with badly injury. But she dropped the charges because she thought that when he got out, he would have done something worse. Jeffrey kept abusing her. He locked her inside the apartment and left to meet other women. Then Misty escaped and she fled to Houston. But Jeffrey found her. But at the time she had another boyfriend and then Jeffrey left her alone. Well, the thing is, the previous defense team couldn't find Misty. And the new defense team also found out that 10 months before the trial, a detective from the Harris County Sheriff's Office had taken a sworn statement from Misty, but she never testified. In 2009, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals granted Susan a new sentencing hearing. And in 2010, the jury heard the testimony of Misty and also from a clinical psychologist who treated Susan days after the murder. He testified in her trial in 2002. In this trial, the psychologist testified Susan at the time of the murder was an in and out of reality. 
They also called a battered women syndrome expert to testify. When the prosecution questioned the expert on the fact that Susan had written a check to go to college and that if Jeffrey controlled every aspect of her life, then why would she have written a check? The expert actually believed that Susan was planning on getting out of the relationship. And they also showed a video of Bradley stating that he never saw Jeffrey hitting Susan, but he had seen bruises on her legs. And here's another thing. The theory from the prosecution that Jeffrey was tied to the bed wasn't actually supported by the medical examiner who excavated the body. The medical examiner testified that Jeffrey had a significant amount of cocaine in his body the night that he died. And this is why the defense team suggested that Jeffrey had come home intoxicated. Jeffrey had also defense wounds on his hands, forearms, back and the back of his legs, which were inconsistent with the theory that he was tied to a bed. Susan was then resentenced to 20 years in prison. She had been eligible for parole since February 28, 2014. She was denied parole on June 12, 2014 and July 24, 2017, but then she was approved for parole on July 2nd, 2020, and Susan was actually released on parole on December 30th, 2020. And this was actually Susan Wright's story, a story that was profiled in several TV shows like Snapped, 48 Hour Mystery, Women Who Kill, Deadly Women, and Secret Lives of Stepper Wives, and they also made a movie out of Susan's case. And so what can I say about this case? I'm gonna start with the prosecution, Kelly Siegler. Like I mentioned before, the first time I saw and heard about this case was on, on a TV show called 48 Mystery, starring Kelly Siegler. Kelly at the time was a superstar prosecution who had a huge high rate of convictions. If I recall, she hadn't lost any case as a prosecution at the time. I also remember the bed in the courtroom. She was good. Kelly was good. Really, really good. She convinced me. I was completely convinced. So I'm not surprised that she convinced the jury. However, after reading about the case, I wasn't completely convinced like I was with the show. And I also disliked the comment Kelly made about Susan regarding her being a topless dancer. Like I mentioned before, this is a common practice to cause damage to a person's character, but this is also slut shaming. And we see a lot of this in cases of assault, when they ask what you were wearing, were you drinking, why did you go home with him? It's always blaming the women and they're always to blame for being victims of abuse. If something happens, it's their fault. Here's the thing, Susan was just 18 when she danced for two months. And here's another thing, I also don't believe the motive for that crime was the insurance policy. For me, honestly, allegedly, I believe it was kill or being killed. So, my final thoughts on Susan. Here's the thing, a few years ago, Jennifer Lopez was in a movie called Enough, and the plot of the movie was a woman who met a man, they started dating, they got married, have a child, then he cheats, and he starts abusing her, domestic violence. As the abuse progresses, she runs away with her daughter, and then he has one of his friends following her until she comes to a conclusion that if she wants to survive, she has to kill him. So the story keeps developing until the end, when they actually fight. She goes to his house, she stays during the night somewhere in the roof, and then he comes home, she prepares the house, takes all the weapons away, I mean knives and gun. She takes them all away, she prepares the house, and when he comes home, that's when she starts fighting him. And I want to remind you, she practiced that, she trained for that, for that moment. And at the end he dies. So I kind of see Susan somewhere in the same position. And I also believe that Susan find herself in a position where she wanted to get out of the relationship alive. So the only way to do that is for Jeffrey to die. 
Allegedly. That's just my opinion. And an indication of this was when she left him for the first time and only time. He actually threatened her to kill her or Bradley. So here's the thing, Susan lost her freedom, but to free herself again and to survive, she would have to fight off Jeffrey. And here's the thing, at the same time, I think the punishment was fair. Now Jeffrey, from my perspective, after reading about Susan's testimony regarding Jeffrey's abuse and Misty's testimony and the assault on the stripper he had an affair with, my opinion, Jeffrey was a serial abuser and he inflicted tremendous pains to every partner he had. It was only a matter of time until someone would fall victim to his cruelty. Here's another thing, I'm pretty sure his family was traumatized by the way that he was killed, how he died, how things went, but um, the thing is, Jeffrey was a monster and he was extremely cruel to women and somewhere along the line they have to make peace with that too. Well, other victims of this crime was Bradley and Kaylee, for sure, they lost both parents. I think when we talk about crimes against women, in this case it was a man who was killed but there was abuse involved and when there's abuse involving women, crimes against women, these are usually downplayed. Domestic violence is still normalized all over the world, you know, and there are countries in this world where abuse is expected and a lot of the times death is the ultimate result. And here's the thing, in this case, the abuser was the one who actually died and she paid for it. What do you think about this case? Was Susan lying about the abuse? Do you think she was lying about the abuse? Do you think that Jeffrey was cruel and vicious? And was the sentence fair? Keep in mind that she was actually released on parole. Don't forget to subscribe, click the notification bell button. Thank you for watching. See you the next time. Stay safe.